This is uh, PAX 164A, uh, Theory and Practice of Nonviolence. Um, so if any of you were here for Chem 8 or something like that, this is your chance to slip out. Okay? You've, you've lost your chance. Um, years ago I was starting this course once and I – could you close the door, please? And uh, I said something which caused a couple of people to get very offended and stalk out. So as you know, we have a long wait list for this class, so I'm going to say it again. And what I want to say is that given what's going on in the world today, this might very well be the most important subject that we could possibly be studying. And uh, there, I said it and I'm glad. Uh, we do have a full class and a wait list, so what I'm going to do is pass around the attendance sheets while we're going and just check off next to your name. Uh, okay. And I'll try to figure something out by the second week as to getting people in the class. As you probably are aware by now, the course is being webcast. Uh, and that should not impact your life terribly much. What it will mean is, well, if you didn't want your parents to know you were in Berkeley, it might be a bit of a problem. Uh, but all it will mean really is that I'm dressed up a little bit nicer than I usually <laughs> as in my unselfconscious way. And uh, if I remember, I will repeat back the questions that you ask me, which is not a bad thing, you know, within – the area known of nonviolent communication, there's a practice known as compassionate listening and that's how it works. Somebody says, oh, I think you're a blah, blah. And you say, I see you think I'm a blah, blah. Very good. And you go on from there. Uh, so we'll actually be being nonviolent. And while we're on that subject, this has been a very good opening semester for me. I've already – I mean the semester is only six hours old and I've – for me. And I've already had an opportunity to practice satyagraha at a minor level, which I'll be telling you about in a little while. Um, I, what I'd like to do this year, and we are going to get into you know, the nuts and bolts and who's in the class, who isn't, and what the, the list, reading list is like and so forth and all of the usual announcements. But I think I'd like to start off with a couple of very simple stories that will kind of give us a framework for what we're looking at. Uh, when we go to study nonviolence, as I understand it. Uh, one technical thing I'll do before we start that, I have some copies of the syllabus here. I don't have enough for everybody because A, the copy machine isn't working in my department and B, it would be ecologically incorrect to make 80 copies of this when most of you have known for years that you want to study nonviolence more than anything and you're in it for the semester and you bought the reader and the syllabus is in the reader. The reader incidentally will say on it PAX 164B, A, B, very difficult <laughs> to uh, work that out. But it's actually PAX 164A, okay? So if for some reason you really want to have a syllabus today uh, and maybe a day or so before you get around to getting a reader, take one of these, okay? Pass them on. So I wanted to tell you two stories. The first one involves a region, not exactly a nation state, and there are regions that are not exactly nation states. This is not the 18th century anymore. And this little region is called Ladakh and it's a Himalayan region and geographically it kind of borders Tibet and India. So parts of it are considered to be politically part of India, parts are considered to be politically part of Tibet. And it got a lot of attention recently, well about 10 years ago because there was a woman who went to Ladakh and discovered that they have some very, very interesting patterns of life. In a way, I mean, she didn't use the term because nobody uses the term nonviolence if they can help it. But in a way, they had a very nonviolent culture with some very interesting attributes which were startling for a Westerner. 
Now I should say that uh, Ladakh was not a subsistence economy. They were a little bit above subsistence. They had very uh, beautiful art, uh, artifacts. It's a Buddhist country. So that's probably the reason that Helena Norbert went, Lodge went there to study them. Um, so these people aren't starving, but they're living up in the higher slopes of the Himalayas. And it's, you know, it's not exactly like uh, uh, Cabo San Lucas there. And uh, food is an important item. And she discovered that, for example, if uh, one family has had a bag of rice stolen, this happened while she was there. And this is serious. This is a major part of their uh, – this is a staple. And so she expected these people to make some moves to get their rice back. And uh, they didn't. So she went to them and said, well, I guess you have no way of knowing who stole the rice. And she said, of course we know who stole the rice. It's a small village. We know everything that goes on. Um, so she said, well, what are you going to do about it? And they said, what? Do something about it? We don't do things about stuff here. Uh, and she probed a little further and uh, began to realize that to these people, community is of paramount importance. And if you take off after somebody and say, hey, you know, you stole my bag of rice, yeah, you get some rice back, but you lose the relationship. And when you're living in a small group like that, the relationship in the long run is more important than the rice. So our concept of justice uh, is not operating here. And people began to realize that this is really, once you got over the shock of these little differences, Ladakh was a very happy place. It took a while to realize that because it was not a rich place. You, know, you did not see Mercedes's because they wouldn't get around very well up there. But um, it was a happy little, little world, really. I mean, I don't want to be too corny about it, but it was happy. People had good relationships. They had a religion that they took seriously, actually involved a certain amount of spiritual practice. Everybody had enough to eat. I think they were probably happier there than the folks that I visited this summer in Nicaragua. But then because of the interest taken in Ladakh by outsiders, especially Westerners, there's this idea, okay, oh, we've, they're such good people, we must help them develop. So you know, by now we know that this is a bad idea. But in the 70s and the 80s, we thought it was a wonderful idea. So they got in and they tried to develop Ladakh. Just all they had was happiness at this point. And it's hard to motivate them to do the things that would lead to Western-style development. And one person actually said, if we're going to develop this place, we're going to have to teach them to be greedy. Sounds like a good idea. So they taught them to be greedy. And basically, the place is a mess. All the things that they had going for them are breaking down. I'm talking, of course, in broad overgeneralizations. That's, that's what we need to do right now to sort of get us started. So relationships are very bad. Crime is high. Young people don't have any purpose to live for. They don't have seminars and meaning of life. And so they're kind of at a loss. Uh, and all of the parameters of failure of a modern society are now coming up very fast in Ladakh. The health stuff, poverty stuff, alienation of every kind. So what happened here? Well, although I am a professor and my job description states that I am supposed to take simple ideas and make them complex enough so that intellectuals can understand them, <laughs> that's what professors do. Every now and then I step out of my role and I ask myself, is there a simple model by which we can understand what went wrong here? And let me read you a quote from the New Internationalist. Is this from the New Internationalist? No, it's from Amnesty International. The first example in false attribution. See what happens when I step out of my professorial role. Uh, there's a singer in Kingston, Jamaica. Her name is Queen Ifrika. And she's told AI Magazine, quote, if you're developing a positive energy, no matter where your house is, you can bring that to the community and to your surroundings. 
And from there we can see if we can bring about a different kind of change instead of taking up the gun. This is written in a very impoverished community, incidentally. Uh, so she gives us this idea of positive energy. And here's what I'm going to do by way of explaining what happened in Ladakh. And again, I apologize for the simplicity of this model. And it was very insulting, an upper division course at Berkeley. But don't worry. It's, it's going to complexify from here on out. But I would say you had basically a positive situation and we introduced negative energy and the thing tanked. Okay? It's that simple. I mean, life isn't that simple, but the model that we're using to understand it is that simple. Okay? So let's take a now a contrasting story. This story takes place in uh, Bihar about four or five years ago. There was a, an outbreak of communal rioting, that is, rioting between Muslims and Hindus. In this case, you read about it uh, in the news, if you still read the news. One of my hopes for this course is that you'll stop doing that unhealthy habit. Uh, anyway, if you read about it in the commercial mass media, you read that this was, you know, neighbors who had seething with violence for a long time. They'd risen up against one another in trouble. But I heard a talk from a woman who works with a peace organization, nonviolence organization, in the north of India. She's from Gujarat, which is uh, Gandhi's home state. Her name was Nirmala Deshpande. And she came from this area where they had rushed to see what they could do. And she told us two things. Said, First of all, do not believe what you're reading in the papers. I said, hey, you know, no problem. I haven't done that since I was 18. Uh, secondly, she said, let me tell you what actually went on in those villages which you will never hear in the mass media. First of all, this was not neighbors. These were mobs who were instigated to do this by the central government. The GOI, the government of India these days, has been in the control of a party which is a very secular sectarian, pro-troublemaking. Pro uh, I, I know it sounds like I'm describing another country, but you know, this is true in India also. And they actually instigated these mobs and furnished them with these high-pressure gas canisters and stuff to do this mayhem. So these are basically, quote, Hindu, unquote, mobs. They come sweeping into these little villages, the agricultural villages. And because they're agricultural villages, most of the men are out in the fields when these, uh, these uh, ruffians arrive. And so it's just the women and some of the Muslim men, because Muslims tend to be artisans rather than farmers. And immediately, without any preparation, without discussing it ahead of time, they had no idea this was going to happen. Immediately, they took their Muslim neighbors into their home to hide them. Okay? Well, hide is a euphemism because most of these houses are a single room. So the Muslim man comes into the house and the woman of the house shoes him under the puja table, under the altar. So immediately you have this wonderful situation where you have a statue of Ganesha or, I don't know, Krishna or something like that and these Muslims are, are cowering underneath it. Okay, now here's where we get to the point of our story for our purposes. Home after home, the same procedure was repeated. The mob would come up to the door, the woman would be standing there in the doorway, and the mob would say, we think you're hiding a Muslim in there. And immediately, the woman of the house would say, yes, I am. And it would be a moment of shock, and they would say, well, we want him out of there. And the woman would say, first kill me, then you may enter. And the mob would turn around and go. So they saved hundreds and hundreds of lives by doing this. And again, this was people who, you know, you asked, stopped them on the street corner and said, you know, what is nonviolence? How do you do it? They probably would not have been able to articulate anything. But I'm going to say, in my simple-minded mode here, that you had a very negative situation, very negative. I, I, saying it's Bihar might have been Gujarat, but that's not material for us. 
And these women introduced positive energy into a negative situation and the thing was drastically improved. So, um, it was improved in so many ways. I mean, you can just imagine what the relationship is like in those villages between the Hindus and Muslims now, now that these Hindu wives have risked their lives to save those men. You can imagine the beneficial impact that it had on those mobs who were being told, you know, these people are going to welcome you as liberators. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's the, that's the wrong conflict. I got confused there for a minute. Uh, I was going to say, these, uh, these Hindus are going to welcome you in. They've been you know, meaning to get rid of their Muslim neighbors. And they go in there believing that violence is invincible. They have much more power than the women have. The women are unarmed. They have all these gas canisters. They're enraged. So they go in there fully expecting to commit murder and get away with it. They have this complete shock of a type of resistance that they did not expect. And they go away thinking. So for everyone in the situation, everyone in the situation, obviously the Muslim men who got saved, but uh, the everyone involved, the women who have a new sense of their own power, the mobs who have a different sense of what violence can and cannot achieve, uh, situation, uh, communal rioting in general, because these things, as we know, have a tendency to spread. Bad things spread become worse, good things spread, become better. So for everyone, there's a huge improvement in the situation. And you look at this model and you look at the world around you and you're tempted to say to the world, what part of this don't you understand? <laughs> it's so incredibly simple. If you introduce positive energy into a situation, the it gets better. If you introduce negative energy, it gets worse. It's that simple. Don't tell your parents this is what you learned in Pax 164A because I hear it's not sophisticated enough. But we're going to fix that in a little while. But really it's that simple and how people cannot get it, it's frustrating and amazing. But if you take that question seriously, what part of this don't you understand? It does have a serious answer and that is people generally speaking do not understand that there is such a thing as positive energy and there is such a thing as negative energy. As a result of that failure, they keep on trying to fix problems with negative energy, thus making them worse. That's happening in every sector of our society today. And this brings me to the, uh, my little Satyagraha this morning. I'm very proud of this. Uh, I went into – I was in the building where I work and I was talking to one of the staff people who works there. She said, by the way, we've got a new arrangement here in order for you to get out the back door or to access the bathrooms before 8 o'clock in the morning. I said, yeah, you know, I, I get in at 7.30. Sometimes I have a cup of tea before I leave the house. It's handy for me to get into the bathroom before 8 o'clock. She said, okay, uh, well, these doors are now uh, armed with this device and you have to plug in a number to get either out to the back, the back bathroom or the front bathroom. But she's being very unhappy when she's telling me this and I'm not being very happy listening to her. And I know something else is going on and she's handing me this number on a little post-it just don't let anyone ever see this because every time you use this number, it shows up on my computer. I say, wait a minute. I go to the bathroom in the morning and it shows up on your computer. She said, yes, this is a security issue. I said, thanks, but no thanks. And I handed back the little post-it. So I'm going to be very uncomfortable sometimes when I show up for the meditation class <laughs> in the morning. Uh, but you see, for me, the cost is greater than the benefit. And I speak as one who did have his backpack stolen out of his little cubby. And fortunately, I didn't have you know, my laptop or, or my ego in it. Sometimes I leave my ego in there and <laughs> take on that problem. Uh, so I know full well that you know, there is a security problem in our building. 
And it's not that I have transcended fear or concerns of that kind. In fact, to tell you a little story on myself, because I'll be telling you many stories later in which uh, I play a rather heroic role. So I think to balance that, I'll tell you this story. I went in one morning, as usual, 7.30, you know, looking around for the door to the bathroom. And I pulled out my mail and uh, there was a notice saying that from now on there's a new security arrangement. I said, oh God, now what? I said, you know, don't trust anybody. And anyone is to be regarded as suspicious if they are, for example, a student or things like this. <laughs> I, I'm slightly exaggerating. Uh, and you know, if there's an object that you don't recognize, report it immediately to Homeland Security. And stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, you know, the hell with this. Uh, I'm not going to do that. This is not how I live. And I crumpled up a piece of paper and threw it away. And then I went to my cubby and I walked in and there was a black satchel in the middle of the floor. And immediately before I knew what I was doing, I said, call the police. <laughs> <laughs> Homeland Security 911, get the bomb squad in here. And of course, it was a laptop that the tech people had left in there while they were fixing my computer. So, so what am I saying? I, I'm not saying that I'm uh, an unusual person with regard to courage or anything else. Um, but for me, uh, I always hear ringing in my ears what the Buddha said, that there is no fire like desire, there is no rage like anger, there is no relationship better than trust. And if you go around degrading the trust in human relationships, you're play, paying a price which is higher than the price of losing your backpack losing your laptop occasionally. It's sort of an honorary Ladakhi in this regard. So the point I'm making is that because we never think in these terms, is this positive or negative in its impact on human relationships, we solve every problem but with negative energy. And that puts the word solve in quotes and it never gets any better. In fact, it gets consistently worse. So we're going to fix all of that in this semester, which is why I told you this could be an important course. Uh, and basically, if you wanted to define what we're studying, we're studying the nature of positive energy, how to develop it, and how to implement it in the social field. Okay? You might almost take that as my definition of nonviolence for right now. I'm famous for my definitions of nonviolence. We have about a 14-day half-life. I'll be bringing in some other ones. But for now, this is what we'll be looking at. How did those women do what they did? How did it affect them? How did it work in the situation? And finally, how could we capture that energy and make institutions out of it? so that our whole world works on positive energy instead of working on about 10% positive energy and 90% negative energy. Okay? So that's the agenda. And um, I guess I'll pause for a minute and see if you have any questions about what nonviolence is or about these stories, the point I was trying to make with them, and then we can talk about how the course is going to work, where to get the books. And Good stuff like that. Do you have any questions? Okay. That's either a very good or a very bad sign. We'll find out in a little while. Um, so you are going to get the reader from Copy Central, and that will have the syllabus, which some of you have hard copies of already. And Basically, the course unrolls in sections. The first is kind of a background and general principles. And then we start uh, with the really the major part of the content, which is the story of Gandhi's career, which itself divides neatly into two phases, the South Africa part from 1893 to 1914, and then the big freedom struggle in India from 1915 until 1947 followed by his assassination. And then that'll take us down to the midterm. 
And then we're going to look at the West because we've been drawing upon Hinduism and uh, Gandhi's implementation of it and how it made – in some ways made it possible for him to do all of this that I've been describing in a big institutional framework. And we're going to look at nonviolence in the West. We're going to look at uh, Christianity where there are some really interesting scholarly developments in the last oh, 10 or 15 years, uh, basically which make it much more plausible what Gandhi used to say. He used to say the only people who do not understand that Jesus was nonviolent are the Christians. We're going to sort of study how that came about. Uh, and then we'll spend about a month with Martin Luther King and then we'll do sort of uh, an overview. We look at, okay, what have we inherited from these people? How is it to be employed in economics and uh, conflict management, healthcare, all of those things? And that's 164A. And 164B, as some of you know very well, kind of looks back at the World War II period to get kind of a historical background and then quickly moves up to see what's been happening in nonviolence for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, which is incredibly inspiring and exciting. Um, in fact, I'll skip ahead a little bit now and mention that I'd like you people to be aware, not involved, but aware, so I don't want you in prison during the course of the semester, uh, that on September 21st, which is International Peace Day, there's a rather large civil disobedience that's been organized, primarily in the U.S., but with worldwide support along very good Gandhian lines. We're going to we, – uh, they. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I said that. We're going to tell the government sometime early in September that we want to see a plan for a complete exit from Iraq by September 21st. Not just a military pullout, but you know, give the country back all of its assets. Otherwise, you'll have to face massive satyagraha from us. So that's, that's the plan. So watch that. It'll be a very interesting laboratory for us. Um, so. Yeah, question. What kind of civil disobedience? Um, that's being worked out right now. I think the first um, audience to whom we were going to – sorry, they are going to <laughs> offer satyagraha is uh, lawmakers, you know, congresspeople. But we're all, they're also working a lot with uh, ex-military people, you know, vet now veterans against the war. Like that. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an older copy of the reader a few years ago, yeah, you'll be fine with that. Uh, buddy up with somebody who's just taking the course now because there'll be a few new items. But basically, you'll be fine. If you could repeat the questions. I'm sorry. Yes, I'll repeat the questions. That one was just about, you know, what kind of reader to buy. So that's all right. Uh, other questions? Okay. So now in the readings, uh, first let's deal with the basic historical information about Gandhi. You're, you're going to have a wonderful book called Gandhi the Man, which has quotes and photos and it is very much a, a kind of inspirational piece that gives you, I think, the deepest sense of who Gandhi was spiritually without which you can't understand anything else in his career and his impact. But it doesn't step you through the history in a historical way. And I, would, I think it's necessary for us to do that. So over the years I discovered there's an excellent biography of Gandhi by an Indian scholar named B.R. Nanda, Balram K. Nanda. And it existed in a abridged edition. It was perfect for this course. So here you have the best biography of the most important figure in modern times. What do you think happened? You guessed it. It went out of print. So I can't get the abridged edition. So for a couple of years I was using the full edition, and which costs a little more. But it's good to have it. And I gave people the chapters that they would have to read. Then that went out of print, which I discovered a couple of weeks ago. So we have two options. We can fall back on a rather good biography by Louis Fisher, which I've ordered and which you have in the bookstore. And would you just read along the necessary chapters for the necessary parts of the history that we're doing? You know, early South Africa, climax of South Africa, and so forth. Um, 
But I actually think that the Nanda book is better. Nanda was actually an Indian after all, and he was involved in the uh, freedom struggle. And so he, he had a better sense of how certain things were working. And what we've done is we've gone and Xeroxed that book, the abridged edition, and it is available at Copy Central as a reader. It costs $17, $16.96, but who's counting? And I personally don't care which way you want to go. You get either one of those biographies. Okay? There's one book which I am not giving you regular assignments from, but I'd like you to just be reading at your own pace and basically finish up in the course of the semester. That's my book. Blush. That's it. <laughs> the, the Search for a Nonviolent Future. Basically, that book came out of this course, so it will be a very good way for you to follow along with the course. Um, the reader, I don't use the reader the way some instructors do. That is, I don't come in and say, now let's look at section 2B and let's talk about it. I will do that intermittently. But mostly, I'm leaving it up to you to follow the third column of the syllabus and just keep up with the readings. Okay? So they're sort of backgrounders. Every now and then, because this conversation in this course will shape itself in one way or another, I'll suddenly see, oh, I see where we're going. We need to have a look at this particular article. I'll come in and I'll say, I hope you have your readers today, which is unfair because I had no idea until a few hours ago that I was going to look at this particular article. So if you don't, that's okay also. So I hope that's all right because sometimes people expect that we're going to go step through the reader systematically in the course of the talk, and I don't usually do that. Um, <coughs> About the webcasting thing, let me say one thing. The reason we're webcasting it, the course, is um, there's a rumor circulating around that I am not immortal, because I, I choose not to believe it, but some people do. And therefore, people really want to have a record of this course. Uh, for people who are you know, terribly unfortunate, people perhaps couldn't even come to Berkeley like Maybe they're studying at Stanford or something. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, there's all kinds of unfairness and deprivation in our world. Uh, we wanted to have this for a record. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is please don't use it as a reason not to come to class. Okay? Don't say, oh, you know, I want to hang out with my friend and it's on the web anyway. Because it's very different when you're actually here and I'm actually here and we're interacting. It's a different experience qualitatively than, you know, opening up your laptop and downloading that particular lecture. If you don't believe that, you really are going to have a hard time understanding that violence. Um, okay, now this course has an unofficial lab. It's called PAX84. It's a meditation class. Um, yeah, question? You're right, you're right, you're right. Thanks. By the way, this is a very good thing to do. Whenever I'm using a number, the chances <laughs> are I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> so do stick your hand up. Yeah, it's PAX 94. 84 is the sophomore seminar. Uh, it's a meditation class. It's never overcrowded for one, well, for two reasons. Because you know, meditation is not all that popular. And B, this class meets at 8 a.m. So it's Tuesday. <laughs> there we go right there. I just <laughs> lost two-thirds of our audience. So, but if you can get there and uh, develop a meditation practice in some subtle ways, which I you know, would find it a little bit hard to define, you'll find it a lot easier to grok some of the basic ideas at how nonviolence works. I actually, because you know I'm a troublemaker, satyagrahi from way back, I actually wanted to get that course called 164L for a lab. And then, you know, then maybe I could get a National Institute of Science grant or something like that <laughs> and solve the whole department's problem, be a hero. Now, you know, I dream on and on. Uh, but the, the uh, Committee on Courses wouldn't let me do that. As some of you know, they they said in order for a course to have an L, afterwards it has to be a wet lab. 
They have to actually deal with chemicals that come in and show them, see, sulfuric acid, see. <laughs> I said Kundalini won't be enough, but yeah, apparently it was not. So I'm mentioning that because uh, the course is open, still has a few seats, and a few people want to take it, you know, like if you have insomnia and you're wondering what to do at 8 a.m., come on around to 101 Wheeler, you will find it helpful. You don't have to sign up if you want the unit of credit. You know, all this in heaven too. You can do that. Um, the nature of this class and of you people is such that very soon, every time I come in here, six or seven of you are going to rush up to the desk and say, can I make an announcement? You know, we're about to stop a whaling ship or hug a tree or you know, <laughs> log ourselves together in some office in downtown Oakland. Uh, and I, we need some help. So for a couple of reasons, I have made it a policy not to take up class time with those announcements. One of those reasons is that occasionally we have had some military people in this class. In fact, uh, I like to have them here. And it, at some point in the semester, I may actually trade lectures with the head of uh, Air Force uh, military affairs here on campus. I got to meet the original guy who was in that position because he was he was on my van. You know, we were commuting together. And he made the mistake one day we were hanging around waiting for the van. He said, "Ah, oh, uh -huh, so what do you teach?" And he said, I could have said a number of different things, but of course I brightened up and I said, "Nonviolence." <laughs> and to his credit, he immediately said, "I want to come talk to your class." So he did. He came and talked to the class, and then afterwards. Uh, in good American <coughs> red-blooded competitive style, I said, Randy, how about a rematch? How about I come talk to your class? We hadn't counted on that. And it was really a fascinating experience for me. And I am in favor of reaching out and getting beyond our community and talking to people. So that, may, that person may be here. For all I know, some of you are in the military affairs program. And I don't want people who don't share our viewpoint to feel uncomfortable. So partly for that reason and partly because it can really eat up all of our class time. What I usually do is I have just people drop announcements here, maybe use the board over there. Unless it's an event that I really like <laughs> <laughs> or that I'm involved in. Uh, so let's see. I just have a couple of things to go over and then I think we're going to stop and see if you have any questions and see how much time we have maybe get into a little bit more into the subject. The, there will be a lot of opportunities for various kinds of volunteer work you come out of this class. So if you have some time and you'd like to get involved in stuff, just let me know. Uh, we have a relationship with Berkeley High School. They want to do some peace education there. So if you'd like to really you know, get, intercept some person's wasted career and put them on the right path, let me know we're going to be developing how we're going to do that. Okay, and then I think the only other thing I have to tell you is uh, that, well, let, let me ask you, what's going to happen on 9-11? Why is 9-11 an important day? This is partly a trick question. <laughs> yeah. It's the 100th anniversary of Sophia. That's right. Very good. How did I know you would know that? <laughs> yeah. On September... And the, the, it will be the 100th anniversary of the birth of Satyagraha, properly speaking, nonviolent resistance, which happened at a big meeting in Johannesburg, South Africa, in 1906 on September 11th, the Empire Theater. Yeah? Right. Oh, you know, the, we're going to be into these words up to here, but that's okay. In fact, it's a good idea because who knows who will come in here after this class, and we'll put it in newspaper headline style. Satyagraha born. <laughs> 1906, Empire Theater, Johann they call it Joburg over there, Johannesburg, South Africa. Theater burned down the next morning, which they, the Hindus thought was a very good sign. And in fact, eight years later, they had achieved your goals. So this is, yes, it's the fifth anniversary of that uh, horrible stuff. 
But it's also the 100th anniversary, the centenary of the birth of Satyagraha. And people all over the world are using the 9-11 hook, or they call, forget the technical term that media people use for this, to raise consciousness about nonviolence. And to do my own little part, I wrote this little book called Hope or Terror, which is very attractive <laughs> and for reasons that some of you know, and is basically flying out the door. We have uh, only a few copies left. And what we're doing is we're using it as a premium if people want to give donations to uh, my nonprofit. So I'm going to make these available to you. I have an envelope here. Basically, if you want to give us, give that nonprofit of mine $5, you can take a copy of the book. I have more of them in my office. And what this book does, as someone told me recently, it basically crash courses Satyagraha. If, if, I'm not saying that this will be a tremendously helpful text for you for this course. If it were, I would require it. We'd all be rich by now. <laughs> but it, it could be a help because it will give you in 40 pages, right? Yeah. And 40 pages, it will give you an overview of how Satyagraha works, what makes it, what makes it have its effect, how to do it, what to watch out for. And, you know, for a half hour or so read, it will kind of orient you and get you started in this. It will also be handy, I think, in case you have a roommate. Because what always happens in this course is people go home to their uh, living arrangement and they start talking very enthusiastically about nonviolence. And then these questions come up, which I know all too well. And people want to be able to say, here, look, read this. By the way, it's five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just leaving it here. Go ahead and take one and uh, put in some money in the envelope if you'd be so kind. If you don't have five dollars on you, which, you know, meaning that you know, you're a Berkeley student. Uh, and don't give me a check, but bring in the cash next time. It's okay. It's on the honor system. As you know, that's, <laughs> that's how I operate. Well, okay. I think I've gotten through all my announcements. So is there anything technically? Oh, there's one thing I didn't mention. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to get a grade? What's it going to be based on? Well, the work quote, 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 for the course is a midterm and a final exam and a final paper. Really, it's kind of a final exam and a final paper. The midterm is a preparation for the final exam in the sense that if you don't do well on the midterm and you do do well on the final, the good grade on the final basically wipes out the not so great grade on the midterm. Now, I wish that we had the time and the staff to work with you on the papers and really help because you're, of all people in the universe, you're the people whom I would like to be able to write well. So I would love to work with you uh, in a really due diligence fashion on that, but, but we can't. So what we do instead is around two-thirds of the way through the semester, you will hand me a one-page description of what you're going to write on. You know, I'm going to try to show that nonviolence doesn't work <laughs> for the following reasons. Uh, and here's a sample paragraph like that. Okay? So basically, you have an exam grade and a paper grade, and they <coughs> basically balance out, or they amount to 50% apiece. What I really want you to get out of the course is the ability to look at an event and say, this won't work because it has negative energy. Or this will work because it's got positive energy, but they're doing it wrong over here. So in other words, you'll be able to analyze an event with realistic expectations. And like any other science, you'll be able to make predictions that this will be effective for the following reasons. So you will be nonviolence literate. That's what I want you to get out of it. That's really the main thing. A lot of other stuff can be forgiven, like forgetting dates, or the name of Gandhi's dog, or <laughs> was it a Jewish theater or not in Johannesburg? Some people say it was, some people say it wasn't. Um, but at the same time, you can't just use these abstract models without a historical grounding 
And you also won't be able to convince anybody of anything. You know, you're going to be confronted with people all semester and then for the rest of your life who are going to say, yeah, but it never would have worked against Hitler. And you go flip to page 119 in my book and you say, in Stuttgart, in 1943, <laughs> no, you, you won't be that bad, but you will have internalized the counter arguments to, to these events and be able to explain the logic and bring historical examples to the fore. The fact is that 3.3 billion people on this planet today live in a society which has been materially benefited by some kind of nonviolent movement and structure. That's just about half the people on Earth have experienced nonviolence and it has helped them in some way. If you look at the grid, the orange revolutions and all that stuff. It doesn't mean that any of them was perfect. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be living in Ladakh, the Ladakhoid states tomorrow. But, um, but there has been a lot more of this stuff and the only reason it doesn't take off and take over our destiny is that people don't understand how it works and they can't cite examples that show that it does. Okay? So now I think I really am finished telling you about how the course is going to work and so forth. I'm going to stop here and see if you have any questions, which I will repeat. <laughs> and uh, then maybe share with you one other model and we'll call it quits for today. Okay, so any questions I had a question? Yeah. Um, The length of the term paper is inversely proportional to its brilliance. <laughs> uh, as, a, as a rough rule of thumb, I would say something like uh, if it's shorter than eight pages, it better be really good. <laughs> you know, Einstein's PhD dissertation was three pages long, but he was Einstein. Um, but if it's more than 12 pages, it's going to be difficult for us to work with. And in fact, that's more often the problem. People get very enthusiastic about this stuff. And because I allow you to pick up what piece of it you like, people will really be roaring on. So what I suggest is two things. If you have a big topic that you've chosen, like how are we going to fix the criminal justice system in this country? And you've written about 10 pages and it looks like it's going to be 40 by the time you finish. Give us a chunk and then continue it later. The other thing you can do with papers, and thank you for reminding me, is uh, this university has what I believe the first ever student journal dedicated to principles of nonviolence. It's called Peace Power. It's very well designed. And uh, the content of Peace Power is about 80% student papers from this course. So that's what keeps it rolling. I'm happy to tell you that that's been picked up in Italy. It's been picked up in out-of-the-way places. The name of that campus down on the peninsula, I keep forgetting. Um, and it, this is something that could have a real potential to spread. So have that in mind when you're thinking about a paper topic that you could end up being published. Incidentally, I'd like to introduce Lara, who will be uh, one of our two readers, and the other reader is uh, taking his comps at the Graduate Theological Union tomorrow. So he, I said, okay, Eli, that might be a good enough excuse not to be here today. All right, well, I think that's it. Any other questions about, yeah? Um, how do you determine who on the waitlist? How do you get on the waitlist? Right. Um, I will have to look into that. At this point, from what I know, actually, I guess I don't know anything about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you usually go to wait, uh, to Right. Well, it the, says, it says this class um, receives off the rate list manually. Oh, I see. Are you asking me how to get from the wait list into the class? Right. I see. Well, yeah, that is manual, except that as far as I know, the class is full. The class has 80 people enrolled. So I believe that that is the limit. And that's a limit that's imposed by the fire marshal. I tried to argue with the fire marshal. I say, you know, <laughs> we often consider immolating ourselves anyway in this class. But, 
Uh, but that, uh, there's, n there's not much I can do about that. As I said, I think I said, I will try and get a bigger room. But uh, I don't think the chances of that are very good this time. So from what I know now, unl unless that sheet comes back to me and it says that 10 people who are on the list were not here today and they're not here on Thursday and they haven't told me why, at that point I will manually drop them and then I can move people up from the wait list. I do that. And what I do is I start with PAX majors, especially if they're upper division, then I go to seniors, juniors. Well, there's nothing else I go by. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure as a somewhat nervous freshman that if um, as of late last night we were somewhere in the middle of the wait list and this morning we miraculously found ourselves on the class list, we uh -huh. are actually enrolled. If you are on the class list, then you are enrolled. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, I should say this, that um, if you do not need this particular course showing up on your record and would rather audit it and speak to me about some other arrangement so that another student can come in, please do. I mean, I've often had three, four people say, you know, look, I'm a graduate student. I don't need this, but I'd like to be there. And, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're one of the students. I'll treat you exactly the way as I treat anybody else, but you won't appear on the class list. And that'll enable me to take a few more people on. So definitively, we will know, for, for waitlisted people or people who are trying to get on the waitlist, we will know the end of the second week. Uh, we yeah? What days did you say meditation on? Meditation is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And I'm there Tuesday and Thursday. What room is that? It's 101 Wheeler. Okay. I think on the schedule it says like 122 maybe. 122 Wheeler? Yeah. I will check that. Yeah, uh huh? Is PAX 84 is a sophomore seminar? 94. It's all one section. Yeah, we, we practice unity there. Is there meditation tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning, there will be meditation if you go there. <laughs> sort of like I remember. I was attending a rally with Dennis Kucinich and people said, but you're not elected. You're, you're not electable, they said. If you vote for me, I'm electable. Uh, so I won't be there because uh, I live way out of town and I'm on campus Tuesdays and Thursdays. But, um, and my office hours, by the way, I didn't get them onto the syllabus. They're Tuesday 10 to 11 and Thursday 2 to 3. Uh, but I'm there, I'm in that class Tuesday and Thursday, and then they, they will start meeting regularly and having talks of some kind on Wednesday starting the third week. Yes? My office hour is in 101 Stevens. That, that's where you go anyway, and they'll tell you how to find my cubby. Okay? Yes? I'm sorry, did you say 10 to 11 and 2 to 3? 10 to 11 on Tuesday, 2 to 3 on Thursday. I staggered them so that if you have a class on one of those hours, you can see me. No one ever comes to my office hours anyway. People always come at some other time. Yeah? Just talk to me at, right at the end of class and we'll try to arrange something. Uh -huh. It's Stevens Hall. When it, that, that does appear on the syllabus, 101 Stevens. Wonder and Stephen is just south of the Campanile. Okay. So let's just take a few more minutes then and uh, see if I can give you a better sense of what we're talking about. I've used the term principled nonviolence. Uh, I think it's one pieces of chalk there. This, uh, this is a term, you're able to get those? Yeah. This is a term that I wouldn't say is exactly the kind of term where if you were in a cocktail party and you say principle of nonviolence, a little duck comes down from the ceiling with a $100 bill in its mouth. 
mostly people will not know what you're talking about. But in the field, the, those people who study principle of nonviolence, and I think I can speak for all three of us, uh, <laughs> we find this a convenient term. Because when you get into this business and start looking at these events, you begin to realize after a while that there really are two rather different things that are going on. And you need a way to describe it. So the terminology that's been fairly convenient is principled nonviolence and strategic nonviolence. And, uh, okay, let's, let's just do NVs now. I say strategic nonviolence is mostly a negative thing that you are not using physical violence. Like I, when I first came to Berkeley many years ago, I was mentored by uh, an old-fashioned socialist. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. Until he got me involved in translating Karl Marx's poetry. Uh, Marx may have been a good socialist, but he was not a very good poet. And I kind of burned out on that project. <laughs> but I remember my friend and mentor telling me that he had been at a rally one time. It was a, a demonstration. And he started noticing that you know, people had these signs. I don't remember what the issue was, you know, fair wages for bears or something like that. <laughs> and, and all these placards were nailed to baseball bats. And so my friend said, um, hey, uh, I thought this was a nonviolent demonstration. And they said, yeah, but it's over soon. Now, that's, that's a very good example. Unfair, but good <laughs> example of strategic nonviolence. It means we are not going to hit you now. <laughs> now, you say we're not going to hit you as far as we can tell into the foreseeable future. You're beginning to get a little bit more serious. You say, we're not going to hit you, you blankety blank, so and so, even though you deserve it. You are practicing strategic nonviolence. It is, it's a strategy with you, it's not a principle. So now I am not saying that strategic nonviolence is bad compared to violence. <laughs> it can be pretty good. And people can be practicing strategic nonviolence and they can say, hey, this is pretty cool. Uh, it actually worked. I'm going to find out more about it. What was the name of that course at Berkeley? It's still time to register. Uh, in other words, people can grow from a strategic posture to a principle of commitment in nonviolence. However, that is not what we're going to be studying here. Uh, although in 164b, we have to study it because most of the nonviolence that has happened has been more or less of a strategic variety. But what these women did in Bihar, because they put their lives on the line and engaged much deeper energies in themselves, I would be happy to call that principle nonviolence. It's in, not because I don't have a violent option. They had probably a variety of violent options. You know, they could go and get uh, some kind of a weapon out of the kitchen and try and defend themselves. Or they could have said, uh, yeah, I am hiding a Muslim in there. As a matter of fact, he's under there. Uh, you know, that would be a, I'm going to call that a violent way to do it. So they had a violent way to do it, which would have saved their life. They didn't know that they would survive when they said, no, kill <coughs> first. And then you may enter. For all they knew, they would get killed. So they took a terrific risk in this emergency situation involves, you know, a very, very deep commitment. And that's what we're calling a principled approach to nonviolence. Principle means in effect, in practice, it means that you are striving for a kind of reconciliation with your opponent. Yes, in the short term, you want to deny your opponent some kind of obnoxious program that he's forcing on you, that's, that has to come first. But you want to do it in a way that your opponent can end up being maybe even your friend. You're not going to do anything to forfeit that outcome. 
there was a, a Greek tragedian Euripides who said, you must never treat your enemy in such a way that he could not become your friend. That was how you go about things in principled nonviolence. And in principled nonviolence, we look at this very first step and we ask ourselves, what happened inside the person who offered Satyagraha? What happened inside those women? How did they do it? Uh, what happened to them when they did do it? So we're going to try to understand that on a psychological level for starters. And we're going to say that my other definition of nonviolence is nonviolence is the force that results from the conversion of a negative to a positive state. Where a negative state is a potentially destructive emotional posture which basically comes down to fear, anger, and greed. Basically the, the three things that drive the economy of industrial nations. Right. You can easily imagine those women uh, confronted with that situation. It's literally a howling mob armed with these weapons. They're enraged. They're coming up. They don't know you. And they say, you know, get out of our way. You're going to kill somebody. It's not hard to imagine that they were experiencing a great deal of fear. Okay? Well, there are three things that you can do with fear, of which the modern world is aware of two. You either express it by saying, oh, yes, I'm sorry, and you run away. Or you repress it uh, and you pretend that you're not afraid. So those are the two that we, generally speaking, know about. This is kind of the fight or flight <coughs> arena. But there's another possibility, and that is to own that you have some fear energy rising, but you are not going to let it drive you into action. You know, I'm, I'm putting it in a kind of long, complicated way because I'm not saying you are not afraid. If you were not afraid, if you were not angry, there would be no energy to convert to drive the nonviolent process. Incidentally, how many of you have seen Richard Attenborough's film, Gandhi? Okay, yeah, that's, uh, in this class it usually is a pretty good uh, it's going to be shown on a lot of campuses on September 11th. The Student Peace Action Network, I think, is organizing that in D.C. But one of the things that that film does not make very clear is these, let's, for want of a better term, let's say these conversion processes that happen in you. Um, and that is what makes the difference between principle nonviolence and strategic nonviolence at, at the deepest level. Okay. Are you good for one more model before we, uh, we buy booklets and go back to uh, the rest of our life? Uh, I want to share one other set of terms with you. You'll find this in my book uh, that will make it easy for you to understand or at least give us a start on understanding how something like these confrontations actually does work. And the terminology I'm using here was developed by one of the great contributors to peace theory and nonviolence theory. His name was Kenneth Boulding. He's been gone now for quite a while, but uh, he was a world-class economist, good poet, better than Karl Marx if you ask me, a uh, better economist and a better poet actually. Uh, and he was a lifelong Quaker and uh, he was one of the inventors of peace theory and he did pay a lot of attention to nonviolence. The other inventor of peace theory in terms of the English speaking world was Johann Galtung, who's actually going to be in town in October possibly standing right here if I can get to him in time. But uh, Kenneth Boulding, toward the end of his life, wrote a book called The Three Faces of Power. Some of you have heard about this already. Let's see. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering, can you repeat the name of the book? The Three Faces, F-A-C-E-S, Faces of Power. Oh, oh here it is. They're disguising the erasers now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the one thing I didn't want to erase. Oh, well. 
I'll leave a few copies of my booklet scattered about. Um, and his proposition is, if you define power as the ability to get something done, then in human interactions, we have basically three ways to do it. And the first is called threat power. People who took Pax 164B or who took me out for a latte at some point last semester will be very familiar with this model. And it's easy to paraphrase how threat power works. And you just say, you do something that I want or I will do something that you don't want. You know, you're driving around somewhere in downtown Los Angeles. Suddenly the car door flies open. There's a person there with a nine millimeter saying, get out of the car or I will kill you. Now that is a, I don't know use the word, good. That is a clear example of threat power. Not all human interactions are this uh, demoralizing. There's also something known as exchange power. And what you say there is, you give me something I want and I will give you something that you want. You make a donation to my nonprofit, I give you a little bit. It's an example of exchange power. It happens all the time. But there is a third kind of power, because if you think about it, none of those kinds would explain what went on in Bihar or in the other hundred or so examples that we'll be talking about in the course of the semester. So there's got to be another kind of power. And he calls it integrative power. It's actually been proposed that we use the term integrative power instead of nonviolence. There's that close of an overlap. And the paraphrase of integrative power is a little bit more complicated. You are saying to the other person who's involved in the interaction with you, I am going to be authentic. I am going to represent truth in this exchange with the idea in mind that we are going to end up closer, more integrated. Okay? Now, think about that in terms of our story. The, uh, these men, they, they come up and they say, are you hiding a Muslim in there? It would have been so easy to say no. No, no I'm, I'm not. <laughs> uh, the perfectly natural reaction. But when they didn't say that, they did something very authentic. In this case, we can see it very plainly. The truth is they were hiding a Muslim. The truth is they were not uh, ashamed of it. They may have been scared to death, but uh, they were going to represent the truth. And in the interaction, the confrontation between the lie of this whacked out mob and the truth of these single women, something happened that changed the situation. All the parties involved end up closer, right? The mob is you know, going to just sweep this woman away and get at their victim. They end up with a new respect for that person. And as, as we've already mentioned, there's a much closer relationship between Hindus and Muslims in that village. In all these villages, actually, because there's actually a chain these things happen in at least 10 villages, okay? So the other thing to be said about this model is you take a look at the world we're living in today. Threat power is studied by political scientists. I'm not saying they're wrong to do that, but you know, they've, they've got a whole building. It's got some interesting graffiti on it right now. <laughs> but uh, it's all retrofitted. Very expensive, has beautiful lecture halls. I often like to lecture in there. They never let me, uh, possibly because of what I say about their field. Um, but you have this whole class of individuals called political scientists. They, you know, well recognized, distinct discipline. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You go to the American Political Science Association meetings. You've got to, you know, rent whole hotel complexes to house them. You go, yes, I'm jealous. But uh, <laughs> other than that, I don't feel there's anything wrong with this. Now you want to ex study exchange power. Obviously, you have this vast crowd of individuals, not crowd, discipline, and they're called economists, right? And 
you, you sweep out the whole Carroll Health Hospital and turn it into a business school. All of these people give them Nobel Prizes, all of this stuff. Yes, okay, it makes me personally unhappy, but that's not the point. The point is that we put a lot of energy and a lot of effort into studying threat power, and we put a lot of effort into studying exchange power. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. So who studies integrative power? Almost nobody. What's the name of the discipline that studies that? Even in peace and conflict studies, a lot of people don't have that particular interest. So you have this contradiction in the Marxist sense that this is the kind of power that we need. If we keep on trying to fix problems with negative energy, we make them worse. They get more and more negative. We must learn how to fix problems with positive energy, and that's what we call integrated power, because then we've not only fixed the immediate situation that we're in, we've improved the relationship of everybody involved. We've sent a better signal out to the world in general that what the human being is capable of. So yeah, we work on our little problem that we're faced with, but we solve it in such a way that it has a beneficial impact on the whole situation. So we must learn how to do this, and yet we've expended the least amount of effort to figure it out. Okay?